Stage one, July the 1st, and you've no idea what difference it makes when the date and the stage number are the same. There's enough going on at the tour without the extra stress of having to remember what day of the week it is. Of course, the riders don't really need to. They're more interested in the lie of the land than the day of the week. And stage one, as is becoming the norm on the tour, is a hilly one, with the decisive climb likely to be this one, up through the streets of Sarang to the finish line. Now, last year, Belgium's Philippe Gilbert won the first uphill finish with a devastating attack. And although he hasn't really got the same form this year, there's huge pressure on him to repeat the trick in front of his home public. More interesting for us and the race overall, though, might be the performance of his teammate, Cadell Evans. He was second on that opening stage last year, then won the next uphill finish on stage four, nicking nine seconds off Bradley Wiggins and several of his other rivals in the process. So today is far from a day off for the yellow jersey contenders, which is exactly the way the race organisers want it. But the... Well, it'll be interesting to see whether Mark Cavendish is still up at the front at the end of today's stage, 198 kilometres from Liège to Sarang, and it's not just hilly at the finish. There are five fourth category climbs along the route. The intermediate sprint comes at 116 kilometres. That'll be the first indication of who's interested in the green jersey. Points for the first 15 men through there. But the big points are available at the end of the short, sharp three-kilometre climb up to Sarang, where Bradley Wiggins and the rest of the overall favourites are going to have to be vigilant too to make sure they're at the front and on the right side of any splits in the field. Major teams at the front. The Lotto Bellasson team have come to the front, which means that Andre Greipel, the big sprinter, is interested. The world champion Mark Cavendish in the white jersey, centre off to the right, just bobbing in out there. He is just tucked into the right. Well, there's your answer, Paul. He's going to have a go. Well, they're all up there, but there's still a lot of control going there from the riders from Lotto. They'll be looking after Andre Greipel. He's sitting in the middle there, waiting for the moment to move. Mark Renshaw is not too far off there because Matty Goss is the man who's going to try and come up there from Orica Green Edge. There's a little bit of a banging of shoulders. Shoulders there too as uh, Motti Matigos tries to get through, but uh, in the fourth wheel there, watch out because I think that uh, Mark Cavendish is interested possibly in testing his sprint finish here. Well, that's uh, Andre Greipel in the uh, black and white jersey at the front there, but still sitting, still a long way to go. That's Matty Goss in the uh, green and white jersey in about fourth position there, and right behind him, Mark Renshaw in the orange jersey. Then Cavendish with the yellow helmet. Well, he might have a little go. Uh, Boyson Hagen's behind Cavendish. Cavendish is moving up slightly. He always times his effort very late. That's when he's got the advantage. This incredible fast kick as he comes in sight of the line. Greipel is the man they've set it up for as he goes for the line now. But here comes Cavendish. Is this a rehearsal for the finish today as Mark Cavendish goes? And on the line, his arch-rival Greipel gets it and Cavendish has to play second fiddle. Remember that... Uh, uh, Mac Goss may have got it on the line there, not Greipel. Mac Goss, the Olympic Green Edge. Well, that is a reversal of the Olympic uh, pre-road race rehearsal last year when it was Cavendish who beat Goss. Well, Goss that's, has that's now... Greipel on the left-hand side of the road there, trying to fight his way up, but it's Matty Goss on the right-hand side who eases up and looks back at uh, Mark Cavendish mm. there. The Australian gets uh, the first little victory there. Mark Renshaw also up there in third place. The Brick Sprinters all coming to the fore. Well, these are the six riders now, just uh, three-tenths of a mile from the summit. Mikhail Morkov, number 175, if he wins, will be the first-time leader of the King of the Mountains in this year's Tour de France. For him, first-time leader ever, because it's his first Tour de France. And as an ex-track rider, Paul, it's like asking a 100-metre runner to go out and win the New York Marathon. It certainly is, but he's attentive. He's got himself, in, I think he's got himself in the ideal position. He knows the man that he has to beat is the man in the orange jersey, Pablo Urtasun. He's sitting right in on his wheel. He's waiting for that twitch, the start of the acceleration. And as soon as he feels, senses that acceleration, he will try and go over the top of him immediately. Now, if, by the way, uh, this uh, Urtasun wins this, that means we'll have two leaders on two points. 
uh, and I don't think they'll be in contention for the last climb of the day because it's the finish and the peloton should be here. Then he goes on count back as to who wins. They'll have won two each. Then he goes to the overall situation, which would swing it possibly uh, to the day. Now they're off, and it's Erdogan who's got a good jump on the day in here as they both disappeared out of sight. Our camera's not allowed to pass the other riders. Uh, so tune in tomorrow, we'll tell you who won the race because they've gone right around the corner into the distance. I'm hoping that somebody will tell us who won. Well, the way he was positioned there, I have to have a guess that it was uh, Michael Morkov. He was right on the shoulder of Utterson all the time. They've gone uh, hollering hol hol up the road there. <laughs> so we'll have to wait for the official race referees. Nothing, referees we, could, nothing we could do about that because the cameras are not allowed uh, to pass the rest of the breakaway in a sprint finish like that. But the man in the far distance is Morkov. He is the track rider and the sprinter. And Utterson, I think, will have gone too soon. But we'll have to wait uh, for the announcement on the race radio as to who got that. It looks to me like it's Morkov. Yeah, I think it will be Morkov. Uh, he was in an ideal position. He's got the sprint uh, much better than I think. Than, oh, he knows he's got it. Well, there's confirmation there. Phil, he oh, knows yeah. he's got it. That's amazing. And, and he knows he's going to have uh, a leader's jersey at the end of the day. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice gesture, too, from Ertuzan. Ertuzan himself is riding his second Tour de France. This man's in his first. And on his first road race day, he has got himself a leader's jersey on the podium tonight. He, uh... Oh, oh there's crash. been a crash on the road here. 67 seconds, the gap, and it's a Rabobank round uh, down on the right. This is at the back of the peloton. So, in a quick look, there's a number of riders gone down there as well from uh, Movistar. Uh, there was a Sky Rider there who has also gone down, who has got up and started to ride away. There's a movie, st movie star uh, rider down there as well, and that is Vladimir Karpitz. Well, we're looking at the remnants of a crash which has just happened here. Skyrider was definitely involved. He's now kicking back in. It's not Wiggins and it is not Boysenhagen who has gone clear and it looks OK. Uh, just a little bit of a shunt at the back. It has left one rider from Rabobank down at the moment. We'll catch up on him uh, when we can. This is Michael Rogers, the Aussie rider. Now, uh, that's a little bit more serious to catch Michael off the back because he's got a hard chase now. Well, he's pretty, pretty much got ripped up as well. You can see his radio is uh, popping out of his jersey there, and he went down very hard indeed. And Michael Rogers has got great form. He just recently finished second in the Criterium de Dauphiné. But because of that crash, you know when a crash happens, Phil, you can hear the scream and the screech mm. of metal behind you. It makes everybody very, very nervous indeed. And you can see that by the way that everyone's accelerating left and right in this peloton to get to the front because they know that's the safest place to be. Yes, and this is now the most had as... Oh, dear me, and the Uskadel Uskadi ride just about squeezed in there as they came into the peloton at the back. As the spectators seeing the peloton being kept to one side of the highway, it must mean there's a turn coming up, I would think. These are the six leaders and still clear of the field and uh, safely away from those shunts. Not too sure who the Rabobank rider was who crashed. Uh, Rogers certainly down. That. They're saying that it was Luis Leon Sanchez, Paul, who was involved in that fall. Well, there you can see, uh, there is the relationship. Uh, you can see all the cars queuing up behind that leading group of six. Well, there's another crash gone down now, oh Phil. My Everyone's getting very nervous because we're getting that little bit closer to the finish. These crashes happen because it's the first day. Guys are taking risks. They're trying to get up to the front. Then all of a sudden, boom, you go down. And that's fairly much halfway down the main field, that crash. Uh, it's not even, it's almost at the front. Uh, the touch of wheels here as they go down right there. But, yeah, it's about a third down the field, a massive stoppage. Fortunately, it was reasonably slow motion, even though we are showing it in slow motion as well. And uh, they're just pulling the bikes out of the pack here. But again, it's riders falling. And uh, you've got to be very, very careful now. That's Maxi Montfort from Radio Shack who went down there on the right-hand side. He's just standing calmly at the side of the road. He knows that pretty much his stage is finished here this hour. But look at this. Look at the pace well, now. The nervousness of all of these riders battling to stay at the front and out of danger. Now, this is like a Belgian cycle race now because when you race in Belgium, because of narrow roads, the approaches to finishing climbs, the strong men get to the front and they ride. And if you can't break in, you tend to fall off. Uh, this is when we've gone back here. This is the luckless Luis Leon Sanchez for the second year, the national time trial champion of Spain. He's been left in a wake today. We saw him win before. It looks like there might be that cameraman, you know, was a little bit too close here because they all started dodging wheels. He should not have been there. Well, I had noticed Peter Sagan and his teammates had managed to avoid most of that. He's in about 15th to 20th position. The lime green jerseys, Liquid Gas Cannondale, they are looking after the Slovakian champion who many people believe has got the power and the acceleration to get out of the gap. There's the...
If yesterday's race was all about six kilometers, then today's is all about three. The final three. Yes, cobbles, climbs and corners. The arrival in Serang has got them all. Once again, I have to hand it to the course designers who've managed to create a route that keeps us guessing all of the way to the line. The gradients are steep enough to bring in the classic specialists, but perhaps not quite long enough to see the sprinters completely resigned to giving up their chance at a win. With just two and a half kilometers to go, and after a few lefts and rights, the road ramps up enough to string out the field. The gradient increases even more, and then they sprinkle in some cobbles. And I think it's at this point we might see some fractures appear that could catch out the unwary GC rider. With just over a kilometre to go to the line, there's a false flat. There's a strong crosswind from the right as well. This presents an opportunity for someone to attack and steal a few metres before the road kicks back up at the final 400. So, who could win today? Well, a whole host of people, but Perhaps the favourites, Peter Sagan and a newly resurgent Philip Gilbert. He's certainly my favourite. And although I know it's a long shot, I wouldn't completely rule out the newly slimmed down Mark Cavendish. There's a little move there. That's Cadell Evans with, again, George Hincapi moving up around the outside. He's up to the wheel of Fabian Cancellara. He wants to stay at the front end of the pack here this afternoon. Now, just look at the way that Cadell Evans is being steered right to the front here with a great show of strength as Cadell moves up there. And Sargon has spotted Cadell Evans go through and has jumped onto his slipstream. So thank you very much. I'll have a free ride to the front end of the pack here this afternoon, but still Lotto Bellisol in control at the front end of the peloton. Stuart O'Grady looking into our camera lens there, thinking about... Matthew Goss here this afternoon. We are up to the final climb of the day, the Côte de Serin, 2.4 kilometres. It starts to get very, very grippy here. The bottom part of the climb is the steepest part, but it goes all the way up to the finish line. Well, Cadell Evans has spotted that Bradley Wiggins is interested in the win today. He can't afford to lose any time to him on a finishing climb like this. He's moving up to the front. Peter Sagan, he's looking for the victory at the moment, and they are all repositioning, and Edward Boysenhagen also there. We're not talking about any real sprinters here, apart from Sagan. It looks like it's going to be a different type of finish. The man on the front is Stuart O'Grady, 16th part participation in the Tour de France, job done, swinging off, he leaves it up to the rest of the boys here this afternoon, this is Albacini now, the Swiss rider on Orica Green Edge, they're trying to sort it all out, in third position in that line is Matthew Goss, behind him another Australian in the red and black jersey, it's Cadell Evans, is he going to look for the win? Well this is the climb now, we have started, it's all uphill to the finish now, and he who gets it right wins the day, the white jersey below us there, two white jerseys, one is Peter Sagan, the champion of Slovakia, Followed by Edward Boysenhagen, the new champion of Norway. And still now every... And Cadell Evans has got himself into third place. Well, he's sitting there nice and comfortable. The cobblestones at the bottom, very, very difficult. You lose your impetus. You lose all kinds of momentum now as Cadell Evans takes over. There's Mark Cavendish attack. is not going to win. There's an attack, and that's Omega Quick Step who's launching. It looks like Chabonel. Sylvain Chabonel, third yesterday in the prologue. That was his best ever prologue in a Tour de France. He's now stomping away. A Frenchman on a Belgian team trying to spoil it for the Belgians today. Day. The legs are locking up, I think, Paul. It's a long, long way to the summit. It's nice to be able to try and do it, but it's an awful long way to go up to the finish line. Even Peter Sagan here is uh, struggling to get across the gap, looking over his shoulder for a little back. bit of He's happiness. Dropping back. They're stretching it out, though, because Chavanel will not give up. There's an Orica Green Edge rider there. It's not to Michael Albacini, but I'm not too sure who it is. He's come up onto the back wheel here. As he comes up onto the back wheel, we're now seeing, though, closing in. Jürgen van der Broek is getting up there as well for Lotto. Cancelar is holding position. Wiggins in the green is on the left. He's just taken the back wheel of Peter Sagan. Evans is in front of them both. Well, they're all battling to stay in contact with the front end of the main field here this afternoon. But Cancellara has got the form because he's making a nasty little move here, but he's covered by Peter Sagan. Well, I can tell you privileged information, but the team manager, Dirk de Mol of Fabian Cancellara, has just told him in his ear that it's no one stronger than you, and he's made him attack. Well, we're coming to the flatter 
part of the climb now at 1.3 kilometers to go. You know, what, Phil, it cast my mind back to Compiègne when he did exactly the same thing. Indeed. Had the yellow jersey on his shoulders and said, right, I'm off, mate. I'm out of this pack. There are not many men in the world can do this, but Fabian Cancellara could. The flick of the wrist says to Peter Sagan, come on, mate, give us a hand. Edward Bosenhagen is coming across there as well. He's looking to try and get himself a little bit of a stretch of an advantage in the best young, best young riders competition. Huge effort, but in Compiègne, of course, that was a flat finish. This is uphill, and it's still got a kilometre to go of climbing. This is a huge effort by the yellow jersey to steal seconds. He wants uh, Sagan to come on through and do some work. Sagan won't come through. And the hesitation will let Boisenhagen onto the back of the two of them. That's Boisenhagen with the yellow helmet scrambling across this gap. Desperate moments, but they're opening up the gap. Fabian Cancellara has got that engine in his bike again, last like he had a couple of years ago when they accused him of having a motor on his machine. He's <laughs> leaving it all now up to Cadell Evans to descend, defend on the front in the red and black. Cadell Evans and on his back wheel is the Belgian who made a move and it failed. Jurgen van den Broek, the field on massing at the back. Now Cancellara assessing. He's in a situation here now because Peter Sagan doesn't want to go round him. He wants to win the stage on his first Tour de France. And Cancellara says, well, I'm racing the time. He goes again. And Boitenhagen is the man in the perfect seat. Well, I don't know. Fabian Cancellara knows it's all about time for him. If he can get another five or ten seconds here this afternoon, he can hold this yellow jersey all the way down to the mountains. He'd like to win the stage if he could, but he's got two very, very fast sprinters on his wheel. He now has to race for time only, not even think about the stage victory. Well, they can't hesitate much longer. Boisenhagen is under stress here. He's just about holding on. But the sprint is open by Fabian Cancellara as the attack comes from behind with Gilbert. And now it is Sagan going for the victory. Can Boisenhagen answer it? This is the first Tour de France for Peter Sagan. And Sagan is coming clear to get his first stage win at the first attempt. That is unbelievable. And win number 14 of the season for him. But having said, Sagan is the winner. The man who scored most is Cancellara. Cancellara is a man when it comes to a move like that. That was a very, very courageous move that he made, a strong move. And, you know, if those guys had participated with him in a little bit of the pacemaking, they might have opened up a huge gap. And I have a funny feeling, Phil, that Philippe Gilbert sneaked in for a fourth or fifth place finish there. Yes, fourth place for Gilbert in the end, behind Sagan, Cancellara and Borsen Hagen. Falco Molimo was fifth, the head of Alejandro Valverde. Robert Hazing showed he's feeling strong, he was seventh, and the same goes for Dan Martin, who was eighth. The bunch got the same time in the end, just getting onto the back of the leading trio at the line. In there were Bradley Wiggins, Cadell Evans, and the rest of the overall contenders. With the exception of Chris Froome, who had the terrible luck to puncture with five kilometres to go just as the pace was winding up and lost a minute and 25 seconds. Mark Cavendish was in a group two minutes, seven seconds down, along with some of the other sprinters, so that answers the question about whether this might have been a finish for him. So there's the general classification. Cancellara still leads by seven seconds from Wiggins. Some of the high prologue finishers drop out of the top eight, which means Denis Menshov moves up to sixth and Cadell Evans to eighth. Vincenzo Nibali is now ninth, one place ahead of Ryder Hezjedal, Robert Hezink and Jürgen Vandenbroek, who both rode strongly today at 29th and 31st. The big loser, through no fault of his own, is Chris Froome, now a minute and 41 down in 84th place.